Welcome to the Ephesiology Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the study of the early Christian movement and its implications for the church today. Today, we're with Michael, our resident ephesiologist, and I'm Matt Hill, a suburban sprawl of Chicago, Illinois. And today we have uh, something special. Uh, Michael was actually a special guest on another podcast recently, and we're going to have an opportunity to replay that on the topic of really this notion of the importance of theology in discipling your kids. Now, Michael, that sounds like kind of scary, the word theology. I know, doesn't it? It it can be intimidating to parents to think that um, there's there's some aspect of theology in how we engage our children with the topics of the Bible and and so on. And so, yeah, I was happy to be on a podcast with Kyle Bartholik, who's the pastor of discipleship at Christ Community Church in Ames, Iowa. And uh, we had a wonderful time talking about uh, that role that theology plays in discipling our children, but also trying to take the fear out of it. I mean, mean, it's one thing for people like us who have been trained theologically to talk about theology with our, our children. Uh, for others, it, it can be a little bit intimidating. Well, I can't wait for us to be able to listen in and dig in this material with you. So without further delay, here is Michael's interview. Just as we've known each other for quite some time now and just getting to be uh, reading some of your recent work and, and you know, hearing some of your thoughts on, on both what's happening within our culture and, and the importance that theology plays in that. I'm just excited for you to join us over this series of, of conversations that we're going to have, um, because theology is, is really important. And, uh, and, and so we're, let's, let's just actually, let's just start there. Um, yeah. In uh, you, you wrote a book recently and uh, titled When Evangelicals Sneeze. Okay. And, uh, and so on chapter nine, you you may you make this statement of theology. So maybe we can start here, just defining theology, what it is, why it's important, those kind of things. Uh, you say this on page one hundred seven. Theology attempts to answer the questions of what and why we believe as we do. Um, so I, to unpack that a little bit, or unpack what is a practical definition of theology. If I don't have an advanced theological degree, how can I understand what it is? Yeah, well, just very simply uh, stated, theology is the study of God. Mm. And uh, we, we've, we've expanded that uh, definition into the study of anything pertaining to uh, Scripture. But okay. literally, it, it, the word itself means the study of God. And so I, th- I think that uh, as we think about what theology is and, and um, its application, it's always going to be uh, theocentric. Um, it, meaning that it's going to draw our attention to God as much as in an academic way, mm-hmm. as in a practical and even devotional way. Mm. It, when I think about theology, I, I, you know, I think of it in those three uh, manners, academic, practical, and devotional. Yeah. Um, theology should always draw us in some way into the presence of God and learning more about who he is. Um, and and draw us to a greater sense of worship of who he is as we fall more deeply in love with him and uh, fall more in awe of who he is. Mm, mm, I, I appreciate that. So what you're, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying is that, you know, when I'm reading my Bible, I'm actually doing theology because I'm learning about God. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I, yeah, I, and I think it even goes beyond there. Uh, n- not only in the reading of uh, scripture, mm-hmm. obviously uh, our theology emerges out of scripture, but it emerges yeah. in a context as well. And yeah. so, it's as we're reading our uh, our Bibles uh, in a particular cultural context, that mm-hmm. theology emerges that uh, can answer the questions that we're wrestling with in our particular contexts. I appreciate that. I think one of the things I've heard you say over the years is that theology, or, and, and maybe it was you, maybe it was some, some, someone else that's smart, but you're really smart, and I respect you, so I'm just going to attribute this to you, uh, is, that theology sure doesn't ha- somebody else. <laughs> is that theology doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? It doesn't happen mm. by itself. And so, you know, our church, our mission statement is that we, uh, 
we believe that we need to be um, connecting. We want to connect people in life-defining relationships uh, with Jesus, right? In a life-defining relationship with Jesus. We want to follow him. First John 2.6, uh, dear, dear children, if you claim to be in him, if you claim to love Jesus, then you should walk as he walks, right? So, um, so part of that is that, one, I need to be enjoying God daily in his word. I need to be reading the scriptures. And so that part of it, right, when I'm just sitting down, that's doing theology. I'm reading God's word. Uh, but it happens in community, just as you said, and, mm-hmm. and it happens when I'm with others. Um, both they inform what I believe, and, and then I, I also engage in a dialogue. And so it doesn't happen, doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, and so I, I'm encouraged by that, because often when I think of theology, and I think, you know, um, if I'm a parent of an of a elementary student or a teenager, and I hear the word theology, I think, man, I have to go do that at some university or some ivory tower, mm. or that's what the lead pastor does, you know, um, Monday through Friday. He just sits in his office and he reads in Hebrew and Greek and, you know, right. uh, Aquinas and, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. all these. Theology is something that's not practical. It's divorced from my everyday life. I live in the real world. Um, but really what you're saying is that it's it, it, it is the practical everyday world that we live in. It happens in, in the community that we have, the people that we are with, and, and in, in, in our, our daily devotional uh, life. Um, mm-hmm. So would you agree that, I mean, theology is really, and I think you make the case in your book here, but I think is that theology is a matter of identity. Would you, would you agree with that? It, it is. I, I mean, it's so much more, but yeah. it, it certainly is that um, because our identity is is formed by the things that we believe, but also by the things that we do and the community that we belong to. And so those three uh, those three areas are what really form who we are as we are followers of Christ. And uh, and, you know, as you have alluded to, um, that's always going to be done in a community or it will, it will be best done in a community and not in isolation. Yeah. And, uh, and it needs to be done with a, an awareness that our uh, context uh, wh- where we are will in some way impact what it is that we believe. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's a lot of those uh, th- things kind of work together and it sounds very complex and complicated. Yeah. Uh, but, but the reality is that we will tend to theologize w- without even knowing it. Mm. You know, we um, it, we live our daily lives and we make decisions based on what it is that we believe, uh, that what yeah. we've learned in terms of what proper behavior is and what other influences from the communities that we're a part of uh, will impact those decisions. And so that's always, I mean, that's a part of what it means to do theology um, where, where, we're, where we're living. Yeah, I, you know, I love that, that you just, again, connecting it back to our, our everyday lives, theologize. That's a, that's a big word. Did you make that up or is that an official <laughs> no, word? I, 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 that's an official word by somebody. I don't know who uh, actually made that up. But yeah, so theologizing is just simply the the activity of doing our theology, living out our theology. Um, yeah. And again, you know, I I I I don't want to sound like a broken record, but theology is is um, is informed by where we are, and we see this historically too. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, there are time periods when we'll identify with particular theologians. You, you mentioned Aquinas. Yeah. Um, many evangelicals go back to Augustine and, you know, we we think about Reformation theology and so on. I, all of those theologies were born in particular contexts and those yeah. contexts informed the development of uh, those respective theologies. And um, and for us that, uh, you know, think more um, about these things, um, it's important for us to really weigh in consideration how mm. a, a historical setting has informed a particular theology. Uh, you know, I appreciate that note. And I, I, I think, I think that's, you know, for us as a, as an evangelical free church, right? We are a Bible believing church. We, we want to preach the text, teach the text. And one of the things that, that we, we say continually from the pulpit 
uh, is that uh, is and I and I Dr. Dr. Carson, uh, Don Carson at Trinity. I remember that he drilled this into my mind, and he always said it this way. He said, "A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text." And so what mm-hmm. that what that means is that if when I read the Bible, if I don't get to understand the background of the characters and the this, the events, the location that's going on. I, I can be really tempted to import my own ideas and even draw my own conclusions or what we might say in, a, in our current context, I would see my own truth. I read my own truth into the yeah. text. And that's a, that's a danger, right? But when we read the Gospels we, or, and we're preaching the Gospels or preaching any book of the Bible, we want to first understand uh, who, who they were, what they believed, and, and then we can go to the cross and then we can come to, to us today and apply it, apply it to our lives. Right. Mm-hmm. So Jesus yeah. speaks, Jesus, Jesus comes into a very specific political, cultural, economic context. And so, so that's, I think that that's such a great heart check. And I appreciate you uh, bringing that up is that we don't do theology in that vacuum. Right. But our, our context and right. the, the, the political world, the cultural rhetoric, um, you know, pop, pop culture, media, all of those things begin to inform what we believe. And so it's, it's really important to, um, well, to stay rooted in the scriptures, I think, right? And, uh, and yeah. to stay yeah. rooted in, in voices that aren't, uh, well, are not up in the frame. We'll, we will talk about that uh, a little bit later. But, you know, so you're, you're a dad. Um, tell us a little bit, just real quickly, about your, about your, your family break up, your family breakdown or makeup, you know. Um, you and your wife, Lori, how many kids do you guys have? Yeah, we have three kids. Um, they're no longer children. They're all adults in, in different stages of life. But um, we have our youngest is in his final year of the university um christopher and uh then our middle son is a civil engineer in the dallas area and our daughter is in grad school uh finishing up her uh master's in social work at the university of maryland awesome and uh yeah so uh, i mean we love our kids we uh of course we do i'm that's a silly thing that we even have to say but um we love being parents uh this time period in their lives has been very exciting for us as parents as we see them living out their convictions in their different places yeah and uh and and the tensions that that brings Mm -hmm. to them and the stresses that it brings but also the joy at least for us as parents of seeing them hold deeply to their values uh, and their love for god yeah, that's, you know, um, in our first month on the podcast, we talked about this idea that as parents, we have this thing, we, God has placed us, right? God has given us uh, our kids to parent. Uh, it wasn't by accident. Uh, you know, he gave, he gave you the kids to parent, you and Lori, right? That, that you were uniquely equipped to parent. He gave Danielle and I, the kids that we are uniquely equipped to parent. And, uh, and that's the truth for all parents, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so even though I don't always feel uniquely equipped to parent my kids <laughs> there, you know, I think sometimes they take just a little too much after their mom and I just don't understand them. <laughs> yeah, you know, I like to think of it as God is uniquely equipping us to mm. parent our children because I, I know, you know, and, and, and again, this goes back to this idea that our contexts inform our theology. I, I can remember when Michaela was born and just standing in absolute utter awe yeah. that God created this human being. And, and then having this deep sense of responsibility and yeah. questioning, gosh, can I actually do this? Yeah. Um, am I going to mess her life up in some way? And, uh, and so I think, you know, parenting is um, a process of being equipped to train our children in righteousness and, uh, and to love the Lord and and not to exasperate them. And there's a learning process that goes yeah. on in this. Yeah, there definitely is. There definitely is. And so as you and Lori, you know, as you guys, again, you're, you know, your kids are in that young adult, adult stage of life, right? Um, and, and as you've walked through those different stages with your kids, 
And obviously, Michael, you have, you know, you have a PhD, you have, you have advanced degrees, you've studied theology academically in some of the most rigorous environments and communities. Um, but how have you and Lori, how did you guys establish really practical rhythms or practical uh, structures or just things that you did within your family to help your kids, to model for your kids, this value of pursuing God, right? Doing theology, pursuing God day in and day out. How did, yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, the, the uh, I mean, these bring up wonderful, wonderful memories uh, of sitting around the dinner table and talking theology with our kids, even when they were young. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think what was core to uh, us thinking about our children and, and uh, discipling our children was to help them understand who they were um, and, and to help them understand who we were as yeah. a family and what it meant to be a Cooper. Um, and, yeah. and, and I think that that identity at a young age is so important uh, to build that into our, our children's lives. Um, I, I mean, there are just wonderful stories that we have of our kids uh, being confronted with issues in public school and, and seeing them step up to that challenge because yeah. they knew who they were. Uh, and, and what it meant for us as Coopers to identify ourselves with Christ. And, yeah. and so, you know, that doesn't happen overnight. Um, and it doesn't always happen in a structured way. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, if I'm perfectly honest, and I know you want me to be on this podcast, <laughs> um, I, I think in some ways, some parents might look at Lori and me mm -hmm. and say, you know what, you guys, as parents who discipled your children, you might have failed in doing that. Not in the sense of looking at our children that they're bad. I mean, our children are, are, are wonderful, yeah. but that we didn't do it in the, in the typical way. Um, and what I mean by that yeah. is that um, I found it for me, and this is part of my personality, I found it very difficult to conform to a structure of mm -hmm. discipleship with our children. And, uh, and because I think that identity formation is, is best developed and understood as a process. Yeah. And that it should arise naturally in our lives, not as something orchestrated. Um, you know, I've, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily bad. It really depends on who you are as a parent. But mm -hmm. uh, for us, what I began to see is that when we try to structure discipleship with our children's lives, it became um, uh, legalistic. And, uh, and you know, we set goals, uh, scripture yeah. reading, memorizing scripture, it, it had kids in programs and so on. And yeah. it just didn't seem natural. Yeah. Um, what we wanted to emphasize more than anything, uh, you know, alongside of the understanding of scripture is what it actually looks like to live out the Christian life. Yeah. It, because Christianity is more often caught than it is taught. Yeah. And that's especially true with children. Um, and, it, you know, of course, you know this from being a student. Um, it, much of my research has been focused on identity mm -hmm. and the formation yeah. of identity and, um, and really trying to understand the Christian formation of identity. And one of the things that I noticed in, um, you know, after years of research is that it, when when parents tend to be more legalistic about their identity and mm -hmm. um, it, without it also being witnessed uh, in their own personal lives, yeah. is when there is a you know what we would talk about as a cognitive dissonance uh, yeah, okay. in their children. And so anyway, I, I mean that's a lot yeah. to say that. Um, our heart uh, with our children was to really build in them a, a deep sense of their identity as a, a Cooper, but yeah. how that identity as a Cooper was was uh, formed in our identity as followers of Christ. Yeah, that's so good. There's so many there's so many nuggets in in just that what you just said there, and uh, I want to dig in a little bit on a few of them as as we I want to follow yeah. back up on them, but. One of the things I love that you said is, again, what does it mean to be a Cooper? 
And, uh, and I just, you know, parents, as you're listening, I, I want to encourage you. Some I've heard from several, several friends and, and just folks that I respect deeply on, from, on disciple making is that it's, it's not just a, uh, a, an individual pursuit, but there is, there is always a, a family pursuit. Mm-hmm. You know, again, a couple of my other mentors, um, you know, say, what does it mean, you know, again, to be an Austin or what does it mean to be a Thomas, you know, and this is a, this is a thing that our family pursues together. And so, yeah. so I love that. So parents take that as one, as one little nugget out of this, a practical nugget. Um, have you sat down with your kids and you, have you talked about what it means to be fill in your last name? You know, if you're, mm-hmm. if you're a family following Jesus, what does it mean um, to, to do that. That's such a, that's such a practical thing, uh, to, and a meaningful thing. It helps, it helps our kids to even to come say, well, mom and dad, uh, you said we're supposed to do this. Yep. So I'm supposed to respond this way. And the other thing, Michael, you said was just that, um, again, as your kids came home from school and the conversations that you had about, you know, Adelaide is Adelaide's eight. And so she's in third grade this year with the pandemic. We, we made the move to homeschool just to give our kids or their early readers, early elementary to give them some stability. Danielle and I are grateful that we're in the position to be able to do that. It's not something we ever thought we would do. Um, and I can tell you, Danielle didn't ever, she, she never sat down and said, Man, I really want to homeschool the kids. <laughs> um, and she's got, you know, Danielle, um, you know, yep. so again, uh, Danielle as well went to Trinity. And, uh, and so, so Michael knows her well. And uh, Danielle's a, a really result oriented person. And so homeschooling, doesn't exactly, you don't get to the end of the day homeschooling and go, I, I did this, I did that, I did, you know. And so that often goes against the grain of her personality. Um, but I remember when Adelaide, you know, again, in public school, when she was in second grade, Ames is a, is a, is a pretty diverse uh, university town. And, uh, and Adelaide had a, a Jewish friend in her, in her class, historically Jewish, nor, or ethnically Jewish, not religiously Jewish. Um, I believe the family's actually would identify as atheist or agnostic at best. So mm. they believe that God doesn't exist or they're just not sure if God exists. Um, but but this little girl, we were on Easter time and this little girl uh, who's Adelaide plays with at recess every day, their friends, uh, started talking about zombie Jesus and and kind of poking oh. fun at Adelaide because Adelaide, Adelaide knows mm. as a Bartholic, we love Jesus and we operate in a Christian worldview. And, 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 and so... Um, and so she came home and, and, I, and I was like, how was your day? And she tells me about this conversation. And, and, and Michael, I just appreciate, again, the thing that you, you drew on is that there's, there's freedom. It's not discipleship. Isn't just this programmatic. I take my kids to this thing to be taught this thing. Right. Um, and, and we've talked about that on the podcast that it's not exclusively a programmatic thing. I love the local church believe in the local church, um, you know, as a youth pastor, believe in the programs of a local church, but they're there as a supplement. They're there to, to equip, engage, and, and be a help and aid to the, the daily ins and outs of disciple making with our kids. And, and so I remember, again, just sitting with Adelaide at our, at our kitchen counter and just talking about, okay, what does this mean? Why do we believe in the resurrection with my second grade daughter? You know, and so the practical moments of of after school getting to sit and just be present to those conversations, such a powerful moment in disciple making. As you said, it's more caught than taught, you know, and so so I just appreciate that. And and the grace and the freedom that you shared there, it's there is grace and freedom. Right. It's not this legalistic pursuit of this program or, or that memorization plan or this thing or that thing. It's it's lived out in our lives. And so. The, uh, and there is true freedom in that. You, yeah. you know, I can remember when our kids were involved in a children's program and, and uh, you know, it required weekly memorization of scripture and just the... The, 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 the name the of this fighting. program shall not be spoken. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't the fighting, but just the struggle and the stress that yeah. it brought on us as a family to make sure that our kids had those scriptures memorized so that mm-hmm. at the end of the year, they could get the award. And, yeah. and, you know, we came to the point and thought, gosh, this is just, it, it doesn't seem freeing or liberating. Yeah. And, and yeah. so once we pulled our kids out of that program and, uh, and, and really gave them the freedom to not do those things, 
yeah. then I think there was uh, just a deep sense of relief and, and you know, in some way, a, a liberation uh, from the from from what began to feel like a, a legalism that yeah. just was foreign to our understanding of the New Testament. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, and it, it's not that the program itself is bad, right? The program right. has good intentions and there's probably a handful of other students that went through a program like that, that, that they, they learned the scripture. They encountered mm. Jesus in a real and authentic life transforming way for the first time through that. So, so those things are great. There's wonderful, there's fruit from those things. Um, but I appreciate just hearing for you and Lori, just your responsiveness to know your student, right? To know your kids, where they were at, what they were feeling, what they were needing. And, and just, you know, it wasn't just, hey, we're going to go find another program that fits. But it, it was that for you guys as parents, you know, embracing that, uh, that responsibility to continually disciple, mm-hmm. continue model and hand off the character and priorities of Jesus to your kids in a, in a, in a way that made sense to them and in a way that was authentic and true to the scriptures, um, you know, and in a way that wasn't burdensome, right. That didn't overwhelm yeah. them that they then would say, I don't want anything to do with that. And so, right. so appreciate just hearing that and your heart in that. Um, yeah. now, and, it, and in a way, if I could just yeah. add and in a way that fit the rhythm of our family. Yeah. You know, we we I, that just felt like it was so important for us to not have to feel that stress uh, to to meet an expectation, but we wanted to disciple in a way that really fit who we were um, and uh, and, and how we lived out our our lives, uh, so that you know the kids wouldn't see a, a tension and uh, a dichotomy, if you will, of Christianity is doing this and believing this. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's so good. That's so good. And again, I think as parents, we need to feel that freedom and uh, and to embrace that responsibility and that, that influence that God has given us as the primary influencers in our kids' lives. Well, thanks for doing Theology in Community with us today here on the Ephesiology Podcast. Uh, you can learn more about Ephesiology in our growing global Ephesiology community at Ephesiology.com. Also, to learn more about um, upcoming courses and even resources for you as a parent uh, as you look to disciple your children in the ways of Jesus and to live on mission. Continue to get other free resources as well for you and your church and your leadership teams. Again, that's found at ephesiology.com. So for Michael and myself, we'll talk again next week right here on the Ephesiology Podcast.